All right, good morning, everyone. Or if you're from the East Coast, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Saith Chaudhary from Carnegie Mellon University. I'm joined by Keith Webster, also from CMU, and Cliff Lynch from CNI. Uh, welcome to the session on Cloud Labs and Self-Driving Laboratories Update and Futures. Uh, the broad theme of this session is automated science, and uh, no shock that AI and machine learning are playing a role in that, but in the context of so-called cloud labs and self-driving laboratories, which is something that's come up in previous and even this current CNI. Uh, this is part of a broader trend that is being captured within reports and workshops that we will try to encapsulate, the first of which is the National Academy's report on research workflows for accelerated discovery. Uh, a workshop that took place at the National Academies in, in Washington, D.C. for AI for Scientific Discovery. Another workshop that happened at Carnegie Mellon last October in Pittsburgh, looking at creating a national network of cloud and self-driving labs. And finally, a Future Labs workshop at NC State this past January, uh, looking at self-driving labs. Uh, there was a, another workshop uh, these two workshops that I described were funded by the POSE program at the National Science Foundation. There was a third workshop funded by the SIZE Directorate, Computer Information Science and Engineering at NSF, POSE's Pathways to Open Source Ecosystems. Um, so we're not talking about that third workshop that I believe took place at Georgia Tech. Uh, these are not official reporting from these events. There will be official reports that come out from each of them. But we, between Cliff and myself, we had an opportunity to attend uh, the, the workshop in D.C., in Pittsburgh, and then in, in Raleigh at NC State. And Keith uh, is uh, basically involved in all the leadership conversations at CME around Cloud Lab. So I and Cliff will talk a little bit about the workshops themselves, and then I think uh, Keith will talk about the CME perspective, and then Cliff will give us uh, the national and maybe even global perspective on this topic. Quick definition about cloud labs and self-driving labs. This is a very, very high level, very concise description, but I think it's, it's reasonably uh, appropriate. So the cloud labs are much more about breadth, if you will, bringing together different types of instrumentation, different types of data, different types of code, different communities of, of researchers into a large scale infrastructure where sharing is primarily the goal. And the self-driving labs tend to arise from more specific disciplines, smaller labs, smaller communities coming together and going deeper uh, within their particular disciplines. Uh, they tend to be more bespoke types of systems, and they're uh, looking at particular types of scientific problems. So broadly, a breadth versus depth uh, is captured between the cloud labs on the one hand and the self-driving laboratories on the other. So some of the observations uh, science has already changed, so we are now hearing scientists talk about not is science going to change because of these cloud labs and self-driving labs and the use of uh, AI with data and software, but that it has changed. Uh, scientists are saying things that uh, we can now think about new types of materials. So one of the workshops, what I heard was imagine buildings being made of materials that are resistant to the wind, but also flexible enough for things like earthquakes and can absorb water from hurricanes, the same type of material. So this is the type of thinking that is already happening. And in that workshop for AI and scientific discovery, what was also very interesting to note was how they're thinking about AI and machine learning affecting the way in which experiments and decisions uh, are being managed. So one of the presenters was talking about uh, a mission that's coming up to Europa. Uh, if you're a fan of science fiction movies like I am, there's always a scene where something terrible has happened, and they say, well, that message will take three weeks to get to Earth and then three weeks to get back to us, and in the meantime, an alien has come through your stomach and all hell has broken loose. So if you think about missions that don't have people on board, like this uh, robot probe, basically, that's going out to Europa, imagine as it's going through the asteroid belt, it has to deviate its course. It can't wait three weeks to send a message and get a response back. So they're literally talking about AI starting to make decisions that we would normally think of people making those kinds of decisions. And one uh, researcher at Illinois said this, I think, very uh, concisely and eloquently is, we used to build machines to do chemistry. Now we need to do chemistry that machines can do. And I'll, I'll go a little bit further into that. He said, in my career, I would imagine being able to see maybe thousands of molecules uh, and we heard from Dan Reed about sort of the, I don't want to say lie, maybe the myth of how science is taught in school. 
And he basically said, what we do is we take guesses. We look at those thousands of molecules, we make guesses, and then we run experiments. He said, I can now examine billions of molecules. Uh, I can have AI in these cloud labs and self-driving labs help me look through billions of these molecules. It fundamentally changes the way one thinks about science. Uh, and I will mention that there's a researcher at CMU, Gabe Gomez, uh, within the cloud lab has developed what he called the first non-organic intelligent research co-scientist. So I think I got that right. Uh, using natural language, not using programming, using natural language, they developed a system to do a chemical synthesis. And this is the beginning of scientific experimentation being done through natural language. A lot of discussion about what this means for education, particularly in K through 12, and I'll touch upon that in just a second. So in terms of uh, sort of a vision for the future, uh, in addition to this idea of being able to look at billions of molecules in a particular discipline, and there's an equivalent in whatever science or engineering domain you might, you might have expertise in, uh, imagine a world with a billion scientists. So another presenter was saying, it's not out of the question that we could have a billion people working together to solve scientific problems. And an interesting question was, how do you work with a billion people on a problem? Not everyone is working at maybe the deepest level of exploration of that problem, but everyone has a task that contributes toward it. And his premise was, that sounds like a massively multiplayer game. Uh, that, that is an interface that involves many, many people working on many, many tasks. There are sort of the uber leaders, if you will, who are orchestrating it, and then people like me who do very small, basic little tasks that I'm told what to do. Uh, this has really important implications in one of the citations I'll give you at the end. And there's a report from NSF called The Missing Millions, and Dan Reed talked about this, how we are not developing enough scientists and we're not reaching enough people, particularly in the underrepresented groups. If you remember that diagram he showed about proficiencies, a lot of underrepresented groups were near the bottom of those proficiencies, right? So there is uh, evidence now that in early, or sort of middle childhood, roughly between six to 12, many of our students lose their interest and engagement with science, but not their capacity to do science. So they're still interested, but we just lose them. Now you map that to games, and there may be some interesting possibilities here. This has important infrastructure implications. Uh, so we are in active conversations trying to think about how do these cloud labs and self-driving labs potentially work together. So one of the things that we heard, or that I heard at the NC State workshop in particular, is that a lot of these self-driving labs are very bespoke, very focused, very sort of honed in on particular disciplines. Somebody was talking about an organic chemistry self-driving lab, and the question that came up was, how well would this work with inorganic chemistry? Uh, and his response was, well, what type of inorganic chemistry? Uh, and then he said, actually, don't even answer that question. The answer is no. I can tell you right now. So there is some degree of specialization that is preventing them from porting even within sub-disciplines of the same, same domain. I think that has really important implications for information professionals, by the way. But beyond that, could the cloud lab become the place where some of those self-driving labs come to have that kind of disciplinary migration, transition, building out the infrastructure to make it more generalized? I also heard at, these, at this workshop that industry finds it risky to invest in these kinds of self-driving lab systems, bespoke systems, because it's a significant investment for them, and it may not translate easily beyond a core set of, of use cases. So maybe cloud labs could have spaces where that kind of experimentation can happen without that level of risk to the partner, and the industry partner can come along uh, at some point. And if you think about movements like open source hardware, a cloud lab is a wonderful place to think about that having systematic uh, or global kinds of impacts. Uh, finally, that one of the lessons we're learning from the supercomputing centers, uh, so the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center in, in particular, is this feels similar to this idea of potentially having a network of a few cloud labs, lots of smaller kinds of self-driving labs that would eventually integrate. If you think about the supercomputing centers and then each university has a high-performance computing center and then smaller research clusters and so on, you can see that kind of fractal nature of being similar here. 
and the importance of working with the diverse groups of potential users. This has profound implications for the democratization of science, right? A billion people uh, being in science. But how do we engage with them earlier in the process, make sure we work with them both from a research and education perspective, to understand their use cases, their requirements, their constraints, their desires, and integrate those early into these plans rather than waiting to build it and then asking them at the end. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Keith, who's going to talk about uh, this in the CMU context. Thank you, Said. Good morning, everyone. Uh, a number of you I know were at the session we had yesterday on the ARL CNI task force on AI, and I spoke then about drivers and signals of change. Think of this as a classic example of a signal of change. So this is the, the Cloud Lab at Carnegie Mellon. Um, I presented two or three years ago with my then fellow dean, Rebecca Dorch, now provost at RPI, on the Cloud Lab project. We were the two responsible deans. Um, so some of you may have heard some of this before, but think of this, please, as an update. But before I get there, let me just play a quick video to explain what a Cloud Lab is. It's much more elegant than me trying to explain it. As chemists and biologists, we've always been firmly bound to the laboratory. For us, the scope and limitations of scientific exploration have been defined by the instruments we have, and the scale of our work has been metered by the long hours required at the bench. It's time to change that. Emerald Cloud Lab is a remote-controlled life science laboratory that allows scientists to execute their experiments without being anchored to a physical lab. In a cloud lab, experiments are driven by issuing commands over the internet, which are then run in a vast, highly automated central facility. With an ECL account, you have full control over every aspect of how your experiments are conducted. Control the transfers of volumes from less than a microliter to 20 liters, and the transfers of solids with masses from micrograms to kilograms. There are over 200 different models of best-in-class instrumentation online at the ECL. ECL facilities run your experiments on demand 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, leaving just hours between the moment you conceive your experiment and the moment you receive your results. It's not unusual for an ECL user to be orchestrating dozens of protocols simultaneously, far more than one could ever manage in a traditional laboratory. When you're ready, you can build scripts which automatically execute a series of experiments of arbitrary complexity, reproduce results, or process the data and generate reports for you to analyze. As chemists and biologists, our minds are capable of moving faster and further than the laboratory has ever allowed us. Take your seat in the command center. Transcend the lab. So Emerald Cloud Lab was a, a commercial operation established by two CMU alums who came to us in 2018-2019 to open discussions about establishing an academic cloud lab. That approach aligned with work already underway at CMU um, under the broad banner of the future of science, where we were seeking to harness a relationship between our research in life sciences and Carnegie Mellon's strengths in computational research and artificial intelligence. Um, another part of the um, project is the construction of a new science building which will be home both to our chemistry and biology departments and computer science departments that intersect with that work, uh, things like computational biology and um, AI research. We very much recognize that AI is used across science disciplines to integrate massive data sets and the development of AI algorithms really is cutting across traditional disciplines, um, 
and is enhancing the design and execution of scientific studies. What we recognize is that over the past decade, the power of AI methods has increased vastly because of the availability of large data sets. Gone are the days largely when we were focused on how do we structure data for ingestion into an AI model. We can now throw unstructured data into a model and work with results. I think one of the challenges that we are seeing already with a Cloud Lab model where so much data is available to us is figuring out what are we going to keep? How do we decide what we selectively store? And we are thinking it's going to be fractions of 1% of the data generated that will be susceptible to long-term storage because the costs of storage at this moment are just incompatible with the volume of data being created. Our Cloud Lab has been built in a facility about a mile from our main campus, actually sharing a building with the library's off-site storage facility. And what we're seeing are some really interesting themes emerging around reproducibility. The way in which the workflows are captured and coded allows, allow us to perfectly reproduce an experiment should we need to try to recreate the, the data. Um, another interesting point is how we're negotiating startup packages for new faculty. We hope that we're moving away from a world in which somebody comes in with a shopping list of instruments and we have to go and buy them and accommodate them and plug them in. Rather, we can offer cycles in the Cloud Lab as part of a startup package. Uh, we anticipate the Cloud Lab accelerating the volume of research done at CMU, developing new research methods, developing new educational programs. Said mentioned citizen science, and we recognize the opportunity for citizens anywhere with an internet account to gain access to the lab, as well as our research colleagues from institutions that may not have access to these sorts of facilities. One of the early success stories for us was the access we had to Emerald's Cloud Lab, at that time based in San Francisco. They've recently moved to Austin. Uh, and we were able to continue our research program during the pandemic when our campus labs were closed through remote access to the Emerald facility. So the, the building work started about a year ago. Um, thankfully, it has moved from being a shell into something that looks like this. It's now up and running. A really interesting part of the project for us has been the shift from a very locked down commercial enterprise model, Emerald really aimed at the Silicon Valley economy, into one where the operating system has been converted into an open source platform. That was a key part of our open source programs office that sits inside part of the university libraries. And you know, I, I think what we're also going to see is a real focus on opening up AI models. And Said can talk probably at another occasion, we don't have time today, about the open forum for AI that we're establishing, where we really want to create a, a network effect of opening up the underbelly of AI. And we see that as being very compatible with the spirit of public access around research and around responsibility and trust in AI systems. Um, my colleagues in the libraries are very focused on helping researchers train for access to the Cloud Lab. They've been instrumental in developing the training materials. We are running a bunch of workshops. Uh, Said and I had a bet early on as we prepared the slides for this that Cliff would not have slides. And guess what? We were right. Um, so I'm going to leave this one up. Feel free to sign up for any of the workshops. They are openly available. You can find much more on the CMU Cloud Lab website. Um, if you'd like to explore precisely what we're doing. But with that, I'm going to hand over to Cliff to take us back to national and international conversations where the CMU Cloud Lab really is just one example of progress in this field. Um, I'll just talk from here since I don't have slides to flip through. Um, this is a very, very interesting area from <clears throat> my perspective. and. Um, 
as um, Saeed indicated, the, between the two of us, we've been to a lot of workshops, um, symposia, and uh, other kinds of events dealing with various aspects of this. Um, they continue, by the way. Um, I would note, for example, next week, the National Academies is convening a two-day workshop looking at self-driving labs, specifically in the biotechnology area. Um, they, one of the things they're nervous about in this area, incidentally, is um, uh, biosafety. Um, they are very concerned about what one might synthesize with these kinds of things if they are uh, made a little too democratically available. Um, it is striking to me that there are really several different and quite distinct issues that are tied up here, and it's actually <clears throat> kind of confusing <clears throat> the way the National Science Foundation in particular has packaged these topics together that really are interrelated a bit, but rather distinct. Um, in this series of workshops that they held in October and then in, um, in January. Uh, so I want to try and pull that apart a little bit for us. Um, so the National Academies, starting with this AI and scientific discovery conversation and some other things they've done, really is taking a broad view here about how is computational technology, AI, and there they mean AI writ very large, not generative AI specifically, but the entire gamut of machine learning, prediction, all, all of those kinds of things. How are they going to affect the practice of science and its communication? Which I think is a really important question for them to ask and continue to ask. Um, I think that the focus on so-called self-driving labs is one of, the, one, of, one of the answers that's emerging to this question. And self-driving labs, I believe, are really kind of pitched at the level of a principal investigator, somebody running a, a lab team. Basically, the key idea here is nothing more nor less than you've got some equipment that is automated that can conduct experiments and pull data, and you're controlling that directly or indirectly with some kind of computational mechanism that um, looks at the data, looks at what's already known, makes some predictions, and um, designs the next experiment, specifies the next experiment, and tells it to do it. The degree of actual automation there can vary greatly depending on the um, flexibility of the interfaces to the experimental gear, the amount of robotics that's involved. You know, some of these are, are very robotic, if you will. Others have humans in the loop doing sample preparation, moving um, samples from one piece of apparatus to another, that kind of thing. Um, so there's, there's a great range of flexibility there. But most of that's happening at the level of individual PIs. And we're seeing some very interesting work in some areas, particularly around material science, molecular biology, chemistry, that really lend themselves to this kind of iterative work. Um, in fact, we're also seeing some couplings that are a bit unexpected. You have some AI research teams, like um, uh, the DeepMind folks, for example, who have um, for some years been working on various kinds of prediction problems like protein folding or stability of compounds, um, proper, pr predicting properties of compounds. And um, they've started producing these sizable databases which they make available to the scientific community. 
Um, one of the things that needs to happen, though, is that um, some of the, these results need to be verified as we go along. The, the predictions are good. They're very good, but they're not perfect. And as we complement this with experimental confirmation um, and feed it back in, they will get better and better. So you are actually seeing experimental projects that are designed almost like complements to these databases of predictions, um, which I think is a very interesting phenomenon and invites some thinking about how we're going to curate this world of knowledge going forward um, and the roles that um, libraries, for example, or um, uh, various informatics experts in discipline may have in that. So that's one thread here. The other thread is really at a much higher level. It is institutional, it is strategic, it um, really affects capital investment and things like that. That's the things like the cloud labs, big shared facilities. What makes it confusing is that as a byproduct, essentially, if you have a cloud lab accessible, you've got an environment that is very friendly to self-driving science. It's already got a lot of nice interfaces on it that you can connect up your computational resource to. Um, whereas if you try and do this in your own individual lab, often it is a tremendous hassle and a tremendous amount of work and struggle with vendors in order to get those capabilities in place. So the cloud labs become, in essence, an enabler for a lot more people to um, start finding their way into this kind of self-driving experimentation. But the cloud labs, I believe, have a lot more to them than that, um, in part because of the democratization agenda that um, uh, both Saeed and Keith hinted at. Um, NSF is very sensitized and very, very interested in this whole question of the democratization of science. And what they mean by that is that a much larger number of colleges and universities should be able to have their faculty and their students um, be able to participate in, to do research in um, sophisticated science um, than the relatively small number of very well-resourced institutions who have all this equipment in place today. Um, they're very serious about that. And in the same way that they have, over the last 30 years or so, invested systematically in um, high-performance communication um, in order to provide access to advanced computational resources for these institutions. And they continue, by the way, to make those investments. Um, you can see a similar kind of vision and discussion starting to emerge around instrumentation. Um, whether, particularly in this financial environment, they will fully take that leap, how quickly, I can't say. Um, I think the reports that come out of these, um, these uh, workshops that we've been at, the NSF workshops, which I have not seen yet, um, and I don't believe are, are written and submitted yet um, uh, will be very interesting in that connection, as will be NSF's response. So that's a little bit of my you know, perspective on it from watching this at a, at a broader level. Um, I cannot resist mentioning that um, I've actually had an opportunity to walk through the facility that um, uh, Keith showed you pictures of in Pittsburgh, it's really something. Um, uh, uh, this is this is an amazing thing that's happening there. Thank you, Cliff, and thank you, Keith. Um, I've put up an acknowledgement slide uh, that we can leave up while people can come to the microphone for a question. I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. And I will say you can read this as easy as I can, but the Sloan Foundation has also funded recently a grant 
for Nicole Nelson at the University of Wisconsin-Madison to do some ethnographic research around Cloud Lab to see how researchers' behavior is changing. So I just wanted to acknowledge that in particular. But please, uh, your question. Oh, thanks, Saeed. Um, Dan Cohen, Northeastern. I'm struck by the sort of uncertain future, actually, that these Cloud Labs um, might produce um, in that I think Cliff's point about they're very PI friendly, and when I look at some of what's going on here, um, it, it sort of turns the PI into a kind of conceptual artist, right? Someone who just creates a recipe and doesn't need postdocs or postbacs or a lab um, to do the science itself. And so one future is democratization, but another future is it really rewards the expert scientist who is creative and hollows out the sort of training ground for the new scientists who would be doing the bench science and learning all that stuff and 10, 20 years from now would be in the position of the PI. And it's something that I'm struggling to figure out of which one of these futures will happen because I don't think a billion people will have the conceptual art, the great conceptual artist's recipes. Um, and so what happens when we lose that and has there been any thinking about that potential negative impact? I think that's a tremendous question um, and it's one that I've worried about as well. Um, I, I, I love your term conceptual artist there. I would not heard that one before and it really does capture a piece of this. Um, I think there are a couple of things that I should um, say here. One is that in the NSF workshop that I was at, at least, there was a very significant faculty representation. In fact, it was predominantly faculty. And I very much did hear that thread of concern about, well, if we go to these kinds of models, um, the next generation is going to lose the bench skills, um, lose touch with a lot of this, uh, the actual messiness of experiments, um, uh, and needing to find ways to um, make sure that is still part of the training. Um, second thing I should say is that this only works in certain pieces of certain scientific pursuits. Um, I do not foresee a time when all of science goes this way. Um, now, whether we will see, you know, growing investment in the areas where this kind of thing works, um, uh, just because it's cost effective and it can churn out a lot of results, that's a really interesting question, too. Um, the final thing I want to do, and this ties into a piece of this that I really worry about, is go back to a little of the conversation I had with Dan Reed yesterday. Um, we are seeing escalating costs for human labor as part of the research enterprise, those grad students and postdocs, especially in the sciences. They're unionizing, they're asking for living wages, all kinds of things that basically make the people more expensive. And, um, you know, one of the obvious potential consequences of that will be to apply more automation so you have less of these people doing this. Um, it will be, I think, important to watch how that plays out, if it plays out, and what that means for the potential pipeline from graduate students to postdocs to researchers to, um, you know, uh, principal investigators and lab directors. I'll, I'll just say very, very briskly, um, you know, one of the um, mantras on campus is that it's still important to teach students how to tap the beaker three times with their index finger, and that's not going to go away because that helps them think creatively in the laboratory environment. But we are starting graduate programs at the intersection of bench and automated research because clearly the genie is out of the bottle. This is not going to go away, but we need to make progress responsibly and ensure that the underlying skills 
remain vital, just as learning calculus is critical for AI research. It's just part of that same foundational um, thinking power. Um, we, we are past time, so thank you for your patience. I want to thank Keith and Cliff for their insights and observations, and thank you for your attention. So, thank you. Thank you.